What's up? This is Keith Kelfis with the Untrapped Podcast. We've got an awesome interview guest for you today, Mr. Joe Kowalski, the founder of Service Monster, now version six. Here is an entrepreneur that, okay, so if you're on Facebook, sometimes he'll post something that is like, boom, it's like, almost like a mad scientist, the way he sees entrepreneurship and just, uh, uh, you could even call it entre leadership. It, it's very unique. And uh, Joe's been on my my radar for uh, a while now and probably same uh, me with him. And we, we, we had to get on the phone. We've, we had to talk and just kind of mind meld. And we decided to do a podcast and, and, and just bring you guys in on the conversation because I really think what that, what Joe talks about, what he has to offer, uh, as well as his software, uh, Service Monster version 6 that he's created from the ground up, is just extremely uh, valuable, a tremendous amount of value that this guy brings to the industry. And he's helped literally thousands of small business owners and contractors uh, all over the country and I think around the world to uh, just implement these systems through his software into their businesses to make their businesses run more smoothly. Uh, I'm not affiliated with his software, but I think it's really cool. He does talk about it here. And Joe is also, most of all, he's a family man and he's in Washington uh, state. And I really think you're going to love this interview. So as we get going, we didn't know that we were recording right away, but we'll ease right into it. And as soon as you listen, you'll get the, the grip of what we're talking about and what he, what, the angle that he's coming from, uh, I got a lot of ahas when I was listening to this guy talk. So anyways, without any further ado, Joe Kowalski. So anyways, to learn how to use all this and to learn in the Evan Pagan, the internet marketing programs and taking, you know, literally fucking a thousand hours of courses in, 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 in my entire studio here that you see behind me and, and, and testing with the cameras and the lighting and the syncing and the audio and, and that and the practicing and, and the communication and the structure and sequence and, and even studying acting skills and learning how to, all this fucking shit. There's so many different pieces of the puzzle that all come in and then you have to integrate it all and do it over and over and over and over and work out the kinks. By the time I finally got my window cleaning blueprint video training course, it's an information product done and finished. What I thought would take me six months took me two and a half fucking years to get wow. it done. Because of the amount of experiential processes that have to become integrated in your brain for you to, 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 to it's mind fucking blowing. How could how long would it take you to reproduce that now? <clears throat> um, aside from having to actually transfer all the data, you know, and, and compress and break down in the video editing, there's parts of processes. Um, I mean, I could do it all in 90 days, or I, if I really sat down, and it's all the other things going on in life. I'm running a service business, you know, 70 hours a week and doing internet marketing five hours a week, right? But if I could just sit down and do it, I mean, I could, I could crank out the whole fucking course. I don't know, probably two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yep. So that's what Evan Pagan is teaching and is an accelerate program right now. He says that the way that these successful entrepreneurs, when they look at something that's really hard, they're up against a brick wall, they can't get through this te this technical block, this business block, they start to say that, oh my God, if I get through this, the barrier of entry is so hard that nobody else is doing this. That's so if right. I get through, then that right. makes me really fucking high value, and I can demand more money, more more value, because nobody else is willing or has the power or tenacity to do this. So you flip the script, script on how you look at problems. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you've already you've already been there. SaaS, SaaS, two thousand and three. Tell right? me. Right. Well, so software as a service. I was one of the very first online service business software available. We were two years ahead of Salesforce. But we stuck. We did it with our own horsepower, no venture capital, no loans. We got a couple colleagues together. We just busted ass, ate shit for four years. Wasn't profitable, but it was so difficult. Nobody was doing... I mean, I, some of my code was written in Notepad at that time. It was just like crazy, crazy, crazy early-level stuff. We were using the internet in ways that people wouldn't conceive of for 15 more years. Um, so, yeah, well, very early into that general tech bubble i've always been like that though. when was this again 2003 2003 
Yeah. So the internet wasn't even born until 95, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's really the birth of HTTP as we know it. Um, and Tim Berners-Lee and his team said, here, world, here's an internet. And it was delivered for document repository and linking for colleges. That was what the pro, that, that's what they built it for. And then the business people took it and went, oh, crap, we can sell shit on this. And then, boom internet you know but and then you know for what five years it was barely basic static brochure sites uh there was hardly any e-commerce right paypal was just getting started and we built the internet all wrong one of the original team members um um roy fielding wrote his dissertation is for his phd in 2000 called the fielding dissertation and in that document he basically says we completely built or used the internet wrong we built it for X. It went to Y. And everybody's bastardizing what should have been uh, this build Z. And so, but we can use our current hardware and the way things to, are together to build Z. And it took about two th- took about five or six years before some of the you know people who mattered started paying attention to this. This is what we call now the web APIs which allow programs like Zapier and ClickFunnels to exist because companies can talk to each other at a data level. Machines can talk to each other across the internet. And uh, like our product, you know, our complete web API first product was um, 2000, this year, 2017 in February with Service Monster 6. And that's 100% on that tech. And we're the only line of business that's that far bleeding edge. And that's why it's so fast and it's so, I mean, there's a, it's so easy to build on top of. We're building a suite of apps, not just one app. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's it makes it so easy because communication and machine to machine language. Anyways, you get on a tech geek bubble here, but. <laughs> You know, it's funny, as you were talking about everything, I'm like so dialed into everything you're saying, and then this part of my brain is saying, you know, oh my God, do you get to a point to what you talk about now, your audience, they're not there and they can't relate to because it's not that they're behind or any less than anything, because there's people that I look up to, you know, that that I'd love to, and not saying that, you get what I'm saying, that I look to hear what they have to say. Because where they're at versus the the perception they're being perceived from, they're someplace different. It's a different space, but it looks to be the same because only it's partially true. But right. there's a whole other element that's happening behind the scenes that allows that to happen. So there's just two things going on there, right? I mean, the first one is um, body of knowledge. Right? Do, am I talking about something that anybody has any kind of reference point for? That's the easy one. Because right? if I talk to you about linguistics and you don't have never studied linguistics, then you know some of it might be cool points, but it's not re- relevant. And then the other side, too, is shattering the myth of intellectual elitism. So this happened for me pretty early on. I was a warehouse manager in a chemical plant, and there was a, the R&D chemist, the lead guy, um, Yuan Tian. He had dual PhDs in biomedical polymer or biomedical chemistry and po- polymer chemistry. Dual PhDs. He like went to school for twelve years. He was a professor. Like he ran this whole R and D department for biomedical polymer, right? Plastic that goes inside of the body. And I show up to work one day, and he's got a little HG pump. The, the diameter is about a quarter, you know, half an inch, and it maybe can pull negative 10 HG, right? And he's got it on his car, pumping like crazy. I'm like, Yon, what are you doing? He's like, I'm pulling the dent out of my car. I'm like, no, you're not. I was like, did you go to physics class with all those fancy chemistry classes? Like, there's no way you're going to get the vacuum power to pull the dent out. And, and for me, that was just a, a moment in time that said, they're all idiots. <laughs> every single one in their own way, which means that every single one of us can be savants in our own way too, right? And so to me, like people might be smarter, amassed more knowledge. People might be wiser, able to apply more knowledge, pay attention, have better perception. And I think these are all skills that people can pick up, but a lot of them are just innate built. And that's what we're talking about, that resonant. You're familiar with the term resonant frequency? So most physical objects vibrate, 
right? The perfect example is quartz. It vibrates so well and so consistently, we can actually use it to drive timepieces and watches, right? That's how a quartz watch. That's how that works. The thing just vibrates, and then we just take that vibration and turn it into mechanical energy and spin the dial around. It's so precise that we can do that. I think spiritually we have a resonant frequency every one of us and we're dropped into this river of life when we're born we have no control over parentage we have no control over you know our geolocation whether we're born in india or whether we're born in nebraska like it we have no control over the in our early lives we have no control it's all decisions are made for us we're told what to eat we're told what to do we're told and as we grow we start to fight through that in our teenage rebellion and you know all that bullshit but at the end of the day, we're still just in this river, in an inner tube, floating. We have no real control over our immediate circumstances. We can make decisions based off of them coming at us. And if we're smart, we can look down the river, far down the river, and say, I'd rather be down this fork than that one. And you just slowly position your inner tube every day, a little bit by little bit, to the point where we're in that fork in the road happens, you're in the right position to take the right path. And that's what playing the long game is about and accumulating these skills. And then if you, instead of doing what people tell you what to do and you, what you're supposed to do, you know, go to college and freaking, you know, white picket fence and work for somebody else and, you know, all the things that society really just kind of wants us to do mechanically. If you just, your mom, your dad, your freaking culture, whatever, you stop paying attention to any of that and pay attention to yourself, your inner voice and no judgment from anyone else, you can start to move your path into a place where your resonant frequency matches your environment. But it can't happen overnight, right? Most people's resonant frequency isn't attuned with where they're born. I mean, how many people do their dad's trade because they absolutely have a passion and love it versus a caste-based system or versus it was the easiest path to take? It's far too many people will just take the foot in front of them and not like put their inner tube in a place to win because they're playing long game and and it, and it comes down to knowledge, right? Wow. Learning yourself in that fog of war and studying through and learning from other people and maybe they have a roadmap that'll accelerate your process and and that's why you pay for those those you know, that's what you're paying for. You're paying for their roadmap, their blueprint, their clearing of the fog of war. So anyways, that's you know, I think most people don't operate within their resonant frequency. And when that happens, dissonance in their life. Everything suffers. Like they hate their job, they hate what they're doing. You know, that spills over in their personal life. How can they, you know, like really spend time that those three or four hours at night with their kids after they, you know, ate shit for eight hours and they're just generally pissed off about what they do because something's missing, something's wrong. And people fill that in different ways, right? Through a spouse or through spirituality or through education or learning. And then sometimes you go through depression and sometimes you go through elation and some, you know, I'm especially an entrepreneur, right? We're all over the freaking map. We have to be, because we have to be passionate in order to drive what we do. But that means that we're susceptible to deep lows too. And so how do you, how do you do that, dude? There's only two things, right? Empathy and gratitude. Like when you're dark, you, you have to figure out a way to accept the gratitude and shed yourself of the fear of, of uh, judgment. And then in order to really succeed and put yourself in a position to win, you have to have empathy for other people so you can identify with them. What does Google's AI for ranking do? It tries to figure out empathetically what the results of that trust search was for for your page. Think about that for a second. They're trying to build a whole learning system to understand whether or not the user had their emotional needs met when they visited your site. That's incredibly difficult for a computer to do, and yet that's exactly what Google's trying to do. So SEO, right, tying it all together. Anyway. <laughs> Dude, everything that you said... Like at little moments, you know, when you're conversating with somebody, you want you want to add in, or you want to start talking. I, I, it, like I felt like the wisest thing I could do right now is just keep my ears wide open and listen to everything you're saying. Because each next place you took it, you were connecting all these dots for me and confirming a lot of things, but shining light on things from a perspective that that I hadn't even considered. So I appreciate. That. I could, dude. I could picture you on the Joe Rogan's show. 
for sure, man. Because you have this, it's a very practical, foundational uh, type of, uh, you know, perspective and knowledge. But at the same time, there is a little bit of, um, what's the way? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll go it's, there. It's a little Hell bit of yeah, mad go scientist there. going on on top of it, and I think that's that's awesome. <laughs> well, think about this. My life is all about balance, right? I own I own a bleeding edge tech company uh, that's steaming under their own horsepower on one side, and the other side I have a homestead. I'm trying to get off the grid in my home life completely, <laughs> like 100 percent sustainable, and, wow. and without any assistance at all no water no freaking electricity no nothing and be able to process our own food and i mean we've got a year's worth of chicken pork and beef in our freezer um i I would really love for it to rain i don't think i'm going to get a fall harvest but and those are the things you have to deal with right those kind of punches in the mouth that mother nature will give you but and it's that yin and the yang too and so yes i have the scientific practicality but i also have this metaphysical drive to me that really like the resonant frequency type of a thing you know that's most people don't think on that level and, and some people will, who are maybe more practical will just kind of toss it out of the side i think it's it's the most practical thing that you can say because it allows you to obje- identify and objectify and go oh that's what that is it's a resonant frequency there's there's something inside of say you that says man i just i really want to be an entrepreneur i really want to uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer used to talk about this. He said, your higher self says, but I want to dance, you know, like, uh, or I want to be an actor. I want to do this. And, and, and a lady who's a housewife, he was telling a story who she, you know, she had kids. She was, you know, all these things, but she wanted to dance. So she actually, they live like New York and she went to start to taking dance lessons just a couple nights a week for a couple hours, just, just be, to get that going. And then within like something like a year, she got to perform at this like mini kind of Broadway show in front of thousands of people. And it's not like that she, she became rich or famous or any of that stuff, but it fulfilled this massive desire to, to that spirituality or for, for, uh, a, a, a guy could be anything. I want to surf, but I want to surf, man. I want to surf. And something inside you says that you want to do that or you want to write. You know, it, it could be anything. And, and finding ways to fulfill that can flower into a whole new thing. For me, I, I want to be an author, a writer, a speaker, a coach, a teacher. I want to travel the country and speak and teach. And I, and, and I, feel, I believe I've been given a gift. And any moment that I'm not doing that, I'm withering up and I'm dying inside. That's right. right. That's right. I call that being chased by the lion. So uh, entrepreneurs, most of us have this, this ambition overdrive and it, yeah. And it's tied directly to what we think we need to be doing in order to be moving the ball forward. And for us, moving the ball forward is whatever we're visioning at that time. And it can change too, like squirrel. And now you have a different direction for that ball. If you're not grounded in a, in a common why, right? But I digress. So you're following this this passion train, and you're just like ambition overdrive, and it drives you nuts. Because then when you're idle time, like idle time is fucking waste of time. Like, what do you mean idle time? Like, people are like, I just want to chill. I'm like, I'm dying inside when I chill. <laughs> check, check, check this out. You'll love this. You know, I have cancer, right? In 2000, I had cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma. You so, did? Yeah, so eight months of chemo and radiation therapy, okay? I wow. missed four days of work because it was feel, felt worse to be not working at home on, on chemo than it did to feel I was at work moving the ball forward on chemo. So I missed four days of work during that whole process. And I was working for somebody else. At the time, I was making money for somebody else. The cancer, I was always a bit of an entrepreneur. I had a couple failed businesses. But that, the cancer is what flipped my perspective switch and said, screw what everybody else thinks. Like, screw screw anything. Like, what's the only thing that's important is family. Like, I can rebuild. Give me a bucket and a squeegee in any location. I'll freaking build an empire. Like, it doesn't matter. Let's go ahead and try this. So I quit my $120,000 a year job slinging code for other people and said, I'm just going to go do this on my own. And uh, that's when we started Service Monster. So I gathered a few people together and had an idea and I already had the kind of the prototype and the thought that I wanted to do. But uh, yeah, it's that ambition. I, I joke. My brother is, um, how old is he now? 39. So, you know, he's like maybe the, on that cusp, first year of the millennial, you know, um, breed. So he's like 1980. He was born in 79, but he feels more like 1980, right? So he's at home 
and he hangs out and plays music and he's never really had a girlfriend he's never really had a real job he's never really so i say you know something happened in our family where i got all the ambition juice being the first child and there was none left for him <laughs> but that's a horrible thing sometimes like i'm awful at frat parties if i get drunk it's business 110 percent, baby i'm like i go like Anyway, drive my wife crazy sometimes, right? Trying to, every time her eyes glaze over, all right, it's time to stop talking business now. But, anyways, yeah, no, it's chased by the lion. Always feel like there's atrophy going on when we're not moving towards our goals, and sometimes that sucks because it's really a, it's a, it's a stifling feeling. You can't enjoy things sometimes. Like vacation for me, it's it's tough. I feel like I want to be like, and I'm in the moment and I'm enjoying things, but I'm also in the back of my mind going, I wonder like how many leads we've gotten today. And like, did anyone need any help? Like with some coding or, you know, or like, what, did, what did I not learn today? That would have been the thing that anyway. So it's hard. Cause this is kind of like anxiety is what it turns into. Dude, I take it to a level that's, sick so if i'm like with a group of people who are they're on vacation they're all just sitting around and i'm like watching them drink and pass around a joint and smoke cigarettes and just endless just talking and sitting and and talking about old shit that happened in the past and things that they've done and 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 or like and i'm sitting there in the middle of this not only do i feel like i'm burning in hell (laughs) <laughs> because I want to get the fuck out of there and get back on my mission, and my purpose. I feel like I'm trapped against my will if I can't leave. Yeah. And and I and I've actually stood up in front of people before. I don't do this anymore, but I'm like, you guys are all you're fucking like. I feel like I'm in the twilight zone, and these people are crazy, and like I'm in a, I'm in a movie that won't stop, and, and I'm like, are, 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 like the the clock is ticking. You guys are literally pissing your. I don't want to cuss too much, but you're, you're pissing your your life, your time, and your life away. How are you okay you with this? The, the flood is coming, and we need to be building this ark. We need to be sailing the seas and doing all these things. Why would you sit around? And uh, I got a buddy, a good friend of mine. He's a life coach, Coach Rob. And he talks about like the masculine and the feminine. The feminine, they want this like this well being and just being in, in presence and being in you know good conversation at good times. It's like it, it's, you know, and then the masculine wants to go to war. People need to die. You know, <laughs> <laughs> things need to be built. And, and um, I, I think I look at this balance all the time. And, and and there are times when, for instance, I'm done struggling and I let go, and I can actually have a really good time just walking my dogs in the park or sitting with my wife by the water and hanging out and having a picnic and it's a beautiful time. Uh, one, one thing for me is uh, I've recently caught up on some much needed sleep. <laughs> uh, I went about four months without sleep and went into a depression. And Dude. as soon as I catch up on sleep, the first thing I want to do is start grinding and getting things done. I can't relax for a second because it, cause, and I'm starting to see like now I've, uh, I'm, Nowhere where I want to be financially or entrepreneurially or anything. I'm, I'm just getting started. But I have more, say, money in the bank and bills paid than I've ever had in my life right now at this moment. And and I said, oh, my God, I would dream to be where I'm at five years ago. I would beg. But right. I look at it and I feel like it's dissolving and withering away in that yep. if I don't keep working. and So, so I could see this if I had a million dollars in the bank literally a million dollars in the bank and money buried and all these things, I would probably still be just as nervous running around trying to sock more money away. And then that's where you kind of get spiritual. Like, does God feed the birds? Are the birds st- storing all this food? You know, you can say, you know, what? I'm going to be okay. And that's where the 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 parasympathetic nervous system and the fight or flight modes come in and you can't sit down and relax for a second because you're constantly in survival mode. Right. But from that place, unless you can let that drain and get into like an alpha state, you know, maybe you can't do your best work. Your best work is taken when you are allow yourself to relax and 
celebrate your eh, success. I, I, I don't know if I buy into that. Like my mom um, pointed it out to me often when I when I was growing up. She said, "The more plates I'm spinning, the better they all spin." Like literally, the more shit you just pile on me, the the better. Like I'll man. It's like Ed Quinlan from Chem, uh, Chem Dry calls me Maestro. <laughs> He's like, because it's just like, and I and there's a lot of people that are kind of tuned that way. But getting to an alpha state, I think, is important because there's there's a, and and I'm inferring the meaning there. I take it to mean like you hit a plateau, right? You've come to a point of what I call critical mass, where you have you're not you know you're not rolling the benzes and you know throwing a million dollars on a bed to take a picture of on instagram or snapchat but your basic needs are met your bills are paid your family's happy you can they can do whatever they want you can take them to karate class you can you know you can start a homestead um you know you can do those things so you've reached critical mass in your personal life and in your business life which means you can actually walk away from the business for a week or two and most people might not even freaking notice right so with 38 employees now you know, I have that. Uh, you know, I have both critical mass in my personal life and in my, pro- uh, you know, uh, business life. Am I where I want to be? Not even freaking close. 2.4 million last year. I want to hit 30 million over the next five years. My jets, buying the jets equivalent is, you know, getting involved with other tech startups where I can provide massive impact, start investing, start squirreling away that money, build a lab, solve energy, retire into professorship. You know, that's that's like ultimately like you know the coolest path I could take. So you're actually starting to talk about some of the main things that I really wanted to talk with you about your, your, that that whole philosophy, and I really wanted to ask you. So, and then tie into when you uh, you you flew out to New York and you met Gary Vaynerchuk, and that was really cool. So at the at the point of when a a small service business wants to grow. The main fears or things that I've come up against and other that I see is very common is breaking through that. Um, now, I could see breaking through the quarter million barrier, the half million, the three quarter million. Each each step has its own completely different barrier and new set of skills and things that you have to let go of and comfort with. Like, I'm beginning to see that. But so ha, to make sure that you have the work and the cash flow coming in. And having to hire people at the same time to deal with it. Oh, I got to let you go up. Oh, it didn't work out. Like, like you got right. people with families depending. How do you take on, like it becomes like an orchestra. How do you take on more of that and be comfortable with knowing that, hey, it might dissolve and not even work. And I'm screwing over people with families. Like, how, are you just very clear in, with yourself and your communication to like to, to build a business and scale it up? And make sure all the math works as well, because if you're operating on just a little tiny profit margin and you have to do so much more volume to tip the fulcrum to compensate for that before you you, you break through like a bell curve, there's yep. a point where if, if you don't cross that Rubicon or make that get that plane off the ground, that fucker is going to run in, it, in, in this whole section of your business or whatever this new, these new people you hired, it could collapse like, and then now you're set so far back. Do, do you just say fuck it and try it in like how, how, how do you do that with somebody like say as cautious as most people are like whoa i've been in the pit before i don't want to escalate this chaos how do you work out <laughs> do you surround yourself with people so can you tie all that up you know what i'm talking about i do yeah and i think there's different levels right and, and they get easier as you progress so the first level would be transitioning from a tech to an exec Right, getting yourself off the truck, losing the what is what do you call it the uh, something trap? What is your book? <laughs> you can bust it out right here. Available on Amazon. Get your copy today. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the landscaping uh, employee trap. Employee trap. Yeah. So you know, I, I assume by that title, essentially, you're talking about exactly what I'm talking about. Is this just getting stuck where you just have this general employee mentality and all you're doing is working for yourself? And that's fine. If that's your goal, I, I, I've come to realize, and this took a little bit of talking to people over 15 years and all of these different business people, what their goals and ideas and aspirations are. A lot of people don't want to be more than self-employed. And that's a big win. And, you know, awesome. Very cool. Um, but if you want to be more than that, the first thing you have to do is, again, you have to shed yourself of the fear of it. At no point 
it's funny as you were going through and talking about the fears and like how did you deal and then like having to worry about letting people do you know how many times i've actually worried about that in the last 15 years of growing this business zero it never crossed my mind that i would fail now early on when it was just the three of us and we were under our own steam and we were profitable and we were having to dump our own money in and those four years were full of just keep pushing forward, just keep pushing forward, the grind, you know, ramen, sorry wife, we have to eat crap, like, you know, so that sucked. And pushing through that, that was definitely the hardest part. But once you hit the profitability, if you have the audacity to want to scale, then you better make sure all of your shit is lined up that you have proper systems in place, that you have an education for new people coming in, you have operating procedures that you can hold people accountable for, that you have leadership skills, and you're gonna grow these over time. Never, never overextend. So as your business grows and you get more profitable, you roll those profit. don't take freaking money from the company. Now, don't 100% reinvest, take a little bit, skim, right? If you did a hundred grand and you're paying yourself a decent wage, say you're paying yourself thirty grand, you did a hundred grand, you're just getting off the ground, right? And then you spend another thirty or forty grand to try to, to go, and now you've got just this little nest egg. You got twenty grand in the bank if you did everything right now that you can use. You know what? That's an employee for like six months. It's guaranteed work. No matter what, I've learned a long time ago that if I put sixty or seventy hours of work in, if I work more than that, then forget about family. Right? And then everything starts to fall apart on that aspect. So you only get 50, 60 hours a week before that shit starts to really play into, you know, making your personal life very difficult and making your loved ones, like, start to be really pissed at you. But if I hire 10 amazing employees, that's 400 hours of horsepower a week. So the way you do it is step by step by step. Baby step by baby step. So number one is before you do anything, make sure you have it. You owe it to your future employees to make sure you ha are doing everything you can to succeed, which means you're getting the margins you need. You're charging the right prices. You have systems in place. You're getting paid on time. You know how to chase the money. Your repeat rate is set up to win, right? The biggest difference in every single service company, no matter their size, between freaking chilled dudes with cigars overlooking ocean views and guys that are still living in hell having to push the wand or the squeegee or the freaking whatever 30 hours a week, 20 hours a week, 10 hours a week is repeat rate. So if you are not set up to make sure that that happens, you saw the little chart I push all over the place, right? That Excel spreadsheet. Company A, Company B, the only two differences between them is a 25% repeat rate versus a 60% repeat rate. Fast forward five years, Company A is making the exact same amount of company money, just under 200 grand, year over year over year. Company B is making 800 grand at year five, and the only metric to change between the two is repeat rate. That's it. And so, you know, if you have your systems dialed in, then you can have the audacity to scale. Once you have that, then using your own horsepower to slowly add people. And what's interesting is the more you do that, the quicker your business grows. Like, I was always worried, because we call it buzz in the tower. Now, keep in mind, my business model is a little unique, and I did it on purpose. I, in my own head, created software as a service. There was a handful of companies that were doing it at the same time, but there was no articles about it. Nobody was talking about it. It was all very kind of hush-hush secret business ninja stuff. We were all still operating under old-school business practices too, right? The ones that our boomers are fighting against, Gen Xers and millennials now, trying to be open and transparent. And boomers are all about closed and subversive and, you know, talk to the clients only when you need to and, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So, anyways, we were playing this game, this war, this battle. It was just... I don't know. I'm just going off in a rant, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, dude. So just, you know, if, if you're responsible about how you scale, it's not a big deal. Um, now, again, for us, we have stable income every month. I created a business model that says I don't have to make a single sale next month to make the exact same amount of money I made this month. That's powerful. 
And I think that service providers can put themselves in a position to do that as well. You can say, look, well, lawn's easy, right? Because it's a generally monthly service, but it happens during the high season. Um, and then you got to switch to something else, right? Christmas lights, plowing, whatever. Um, you know, carpet cleaning has these ebbs and flows, right? These dips and, and valleys. And you've got to play against those. You've got to make sure you've got money in the bank and things for the guys to do and that kind of stuff. So you start to end up tacking on more services and whatnot as you move forward to, to you know, stabilize that income. And so some people look at my business model and go, yeah, but Joe, subcontext, you're a freaking genius. Your business model allows you to be a little bit more yeah <laughs> that's on purpose like i started it that way but just because you're a service business doesn't mean you can't kind of adopt those same general philosophies of continuity and, of continuing money flowing in cash that's right. flow that's right all about cash flow and then you know if there's no cash flow then what can you and your business be doing to generate attention so that's the next thing that you have to go to. Like they could be washing the truck and keeping up with shop maintenance and whatnot. But, you know, marketing is about attention. And what can your crew be doing to help gather more attention? There's a lot of different things. Some of them like playing on social. Some of them like, you know, shooting video. Some of them like editing video, like using and leveraging their passions during times of slow time in order to facilitate business growth. Uh, and I do that. I've got I've got a full of uh, creative marketing team, full of creatives. All of them I stole from different areas of the business. Just found out they had a passion for video editing or a passion for artwork. And if you look at our shit, dude, it's insane. Like we're top notch. Like this stuff is gorgeous. They make me look like a genius. <laughs> That's very important. That top shelf look in perspective. Yeah. Well, and again, you can. Don't misrepresent it too, right? You can do it with a phone. You can do top shelf stuff with this as a recording device and a couple hours behind Adobe Premiere. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I don't, I don't want to minimize like you need because what five years ago it cost a million dollars to go live. Did you know that a million dollars to go live because the only platform to do it was television? Five years ago. Yeah. Wow. I, I remember tw 2012 was a turning point on the internet when, when, when things just started going in this like totally. YouTube, right? Really started after Google bought them. And everybody was like playing with it. But as soon as Google bought them, half of the people were like, what? Why did they spend so much? I don't get it. I was like, I totally get it. It's the next version of, you know wanted posters on tree trunks like this evolution of communication and attention and then this educational platform that youtube has now become it's not just entertainment obviously um, but man for the most part people go there to listen to their gurus to listen to the people that they connect with and the message that they're bringing right so you know education is like so important and now we have this world you know what is it a hundred years ago education was limited to the aristocracy right homeschooling governesses there was no public schools right they just start i mean i guess it started a little in the 1800s right um mid 1800s or with the some of the expansions but it was still kind of not really what we understand as general education and schooling which i have a big issue with in general you know i'm we homeschool too just <laughs> fyi so you know we don't our kids don't go to public school um it's just I don't know. It's education and intellectual curiosity. That's the name of the game. Like, as a homeschool parent, my only job is instilling intellectual curiosity and then facilitating what they want, what they want to learn. So, I, did that answer your question, though? I mean, so slow, get your shit in order. If you have the audacity to do it, make sure you've got the systems and thought processes in place in order to make it happen, then play the long game. It's not going to happen overnight. The, the, what you're talking about, see, I'll pick up like a general, uh, I'll get a feeling off of everything you're saying. It'll come, and what it is is um, I look at it as this, uh, this, this impossible type of mountain, but you're saying when all these things are in place, it can just organically... Scale it's an escalator. Up. Yeah. 
Yeah. You build an escalator. That's what you do. And then you stand on the freaking thing and let it take you to the top one step at a time. Wow. Because I have all these yeah buts in my business of course specifically. You do. I say yeah. I say I look at the average amount of money coming in per job and I say, okay, so for me to scale this thing legitimately, like right. Obviously, with the background check and the drug screen, and uh, make sure all the employees are, you know, proper uh, payroll taxes, workers' compensation, everything is, you know, all legit with training and all that. The amount of time and energy and money I would have to go so far backwards in order to go forwards again to scale that up. And yep. um, I look at all, you know, the clients that I've had and all the people we've done work for, and all the clients I've lost just by raising my prices. I said, oh my god, I would have to spend a lot more money in marketing and advertising to make the phone run ring even more to be able to sift through more people and do more quotes to only pick off and skim off the top of the amount of jobs that are willing to pay that amount of money to support a legitimate company and then to get more trucks on the road like uh to do that uh for me would take uh i know that i could do it and it would take a like like an incubator, it would take an obsession with nursing that thing and getting that next crew going, and then and then when I really look at all, I don't even want to do any of that. I have, it's like yeah, um, sure. No, no, the the value proposition isn't necessarily there because uh, perfect example. We have a call center here, uh, not just for our own support, but we actually answer the phones for service companies, um, and that is hugely successful. We just started it like six or eight months ago. I never plan on having more than 50 clients on that product, ever. And I could grow it to a thousand clients on that product, but I'd have to have so many CSRs, so many people answering the phones that, you know, could I scale it? Yes, but the amount of horsepower for people and space and parking and all the logistics surrounding, it just doesn't make sense. So the question would be, why do I have it in the first place? It's a lab for me. I get to say, we use Service Monster every day the exact same way you do. And so we get to make sure that we fully understand how it works in the real field. No other software company does that. No other software company actually uses the product that they build in order to then help facilitate the client. So that's the only reason why we have it. Am I making a little bit of skin off that? Sure. Roll that back into the business. Do I want to scale it, though? No. And so, And also, what does scale mean? Scale means totally different things. Like I was in a, working for a Boeing subsidiary. The first thing I ever scaled. We worked on these little heat sink parts where you had to kind of deburr them by hand. And I changed the process. And I came up with a machine deburring process using a buffer wheel. It was kind of tricky. Like I had to play around with it in order to get it right. But the I would finish an entire cart. And that cart usually took a crew of eight two days. And I would finish the entire cart in an hour. And so... Now, all of a sudden, now you're talking about scale, right? And then their their employee costs for that product went so low. Their margins went so high. They made a shitload of money off that little product. Now, it went from making, you know, a million to 10 million over the course of the year because they could handle more volume. They could take in more orders. Is that scale, right? Because a lot of people talk about the unicorn scale, like they want to be at $100 million or whatever. So getting yourself in check with what scale practically means and then looking at those numbers and say, is it worth the effort, right? And scaling a service business really only happens with regional networks or franchising models, right? And unless you do something radically different, a, di uh, um, what, a disruption, and so what can you do with landscaping and people who have those skills? How can you come up with a disruptor in order to serve a need in the community that isn't being met at high repetitive volume with good margins? And I can think of a half a dozen just sitting right here with you on landscaping type stuff. It's just really like looking around and trying to figure out like what else you can add. And I'm sure you've done, you've done this for a long time. You've written books on it, but you know, you actually have to be realistic. What does that model look like? What does scale really look like? Um, I'm working with a new franchise right now. We're in contract, so I'm not going to talk about who they are. But they have a really interesting model. It's not really a franchise. It's kind of like a buyer's group, right? You can buy the products from the franchise if you want. And then you can actually get education on how to use them, which gives you a little badge, which gives you some certification to use their products. And then you can be like in an inner circle where they're actually actively seeking out leads 
for certified users of their products and chemical in the areas where they have people using their products and chemical and then giving those leads high dollar too i'm talking like fifteen thousand dollar commercial jobs right to those uh, end users to help facilitate their growth and so forth what, is, what in, in that model what happens no franchise because it's just a general buyer's club structure like don't have to worry about you know the the legal stuff that gets associated with that because it gets crazy franchises make their money off juice and gear he's doing the same thing juice and gear is primarily where their income is coming from but he's helping facilitate by giving work and actually actively seeking to provide real high dollar work especially and here's my favorite part they give it to the low fruit guys they give it to the guys on their way up the ladder they don't give those jobs to the established people they give it to the people who need a regular source of income so that they can build up their business i think it's a genius model right and so now he's got 100 trucks on the road in the united states what can you do with that all of a sudden now? A hundred trucks that are certified to use this specific product line, and now with leads generation and all, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that, that you could do if you wanted to disrupt, right? Build a little app and boom, like anybody who buys product, like, I mean, just, it's crazy. What just... It's just little changes in business models make huge impact. Look at what I did with software. Until I offered it online at a monthly rate, the only way to buy it especially enterprise level CRM was by high dollar companies. You're talking about a million dollars signing bonus, signing contract and a couple tens of thousands of dollars a month. And I went, or the other route was a CD, right? Spent $3,500 on somebody's rinkety ass access database driven product that you can unload on your desktop with no connectability from anything else and and then if your hard drive crashed your hose because you know you're not doing backups on a regular basis right and i came in and said okay i'm gonna offer software but i'm gonna take the infrastructure worry away you're just gonna use your browser and use your product that way i can make sure that you always are on the latest version you don't have to update your crap all the time. And when you call support, which version are you using so I can help you most efficiently? Like, I took all that stuff away, all that infrastructure out of their hands. And I was able to deliver Fortune 500 level software at a price a service provider can afford, 80 bucks, 100 bucks a month. So just those little changes. And then in doing so, right, we stabilized our own business model. Of course, my chart went like this in five years. And here I am 15 years later, and it looks more like this, right? So it's stable and steady, and it's predictable, but it's slow. And you have to be willing to sacrifice that. If I get a VC funding, dump in a shitload of money, could I be more aggressive with my marketing? Yeah. But then I also sell part of my soul. Like, you know, what's going to happen with that venture down the line? How much control do I have? A lot of times these guys want more control or ridiculous interest rates or whatever. So, anyway. Hey, yup, yup. Uh huh. I'm sitting here absorbing everything that you just said. <laughs> okay, so and also there's going to be a little clip in here. I'm gonna, I want to introduce you, and I'll cut it and edit, and I'll put it at the sure. beginning. I'll do it right now, actually. Um, Absolutely. Right here, we're on a we're on a an interview with Mr. Joe Kowalski, the founder of Service Monster and Service Monster Six cur currently. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, uh, where you live, a little bit about your family, and then about your service what it is and what it does and who it does does it for and your sure. main uh, your mission my mission um joe kowalski ceo and founder of service monster um we do online business management marketing so it's like crm plus field service plus marketing automation um we target service companies carpet cleaning has been our big base we processed over a million jobs last year for a total of 380 million dollars in revenue um and now we're moving into window cleaning pressure washing lawn care you know hvac all the the tier um, as you mentioned, Service Monster 6, we released that in February. That's kind of my magnum opus. I had an idea and a vision in 2003 of what I wanted to build, and it was based off three business principles, long tail, SaaS, software as a service, and then 
something that I have yet to identify a name for because the industry doesn't know about it, which is this adaptive technology. It basically allows us to develop 12 times faster than our competitors um, on a platform that's just wickedly mobile, super friendly, super easy to use, and super easy to build on. So, um, And I couldn't offer that third rung until the web browser technology caught up with my vision. And we didn't get that tech until about two or three years ago. So then I started working on our next generation, and that's our fourth complete rebuild. So I'm really excited about that product. Super awesome. When I started the company, it was about helping small businesses survive and succeed and grow. Um, I wanted to give them the advantage of Fortune 500 level tech at a price that a service provider could afford. Um, and so we take care of a lot of that, and we've been doing this for almost 15 years now. So um, helping businesses grow and win that's kind of my passion that's where i came from like you know i don't have a college degree i had to fight i was always the underdog and then tackling you know technology in the early 2000s um that was a uh, you know nobody thought i was going to succeed right no college education and and i understood tech at that time but i mean the the unicorns were done in harvard so anyways um so you know Built uh, built that business up to help service providers and um, live here in Bellingham, beautiful area. We moved here on purpose. We started our company in Sacramento uh, and then knew we needed to get out of California just to survive generally as a business and um, chose Washington State. And so we're here in Bellingham, right close to the Canadian border. Um, married for 22 years, have five kids. We homeschool. We've got a homestead. We grow, uh, we're grow. we growing more and more of all of our own food, our meat and veg and fruits. So... That's kind of the the quick summary there. Okay, and then for brand new people uh, watching, if if uh, they don't know you, what is Service Monster Six? What does it do? What is it? What does it do? Yeah, so again, it's a CRM plus field service plus marketing automation. What it allows you to do, um, capture leads coming in through your website automatically, get notified, uh, process your sales, manage your sales pipeline, customer relation management, right? Their entire life cycle and history, making sure you're staying in contact with them so you can maximize your repeat rate, manages your scheduling and optimizes your drive times, helping you keep jobs in the same area and the local area you can if you have bigger crews you can track your technicians through gps mapping um wait lists and all kinds of fun stuff marketing is through the roof you can do mail merge um you can do email merge you can do direct mail you can do um, call campaigns and then you can do export campaigns for use of third-party vendors we also have a product called fill my schedule which is a direct mail component we'll do for you so it's direct mail automatically like your thank you and reminder cards that kind of stuff um, we have massive integrations so we have a whole marketplace where other companies hook up with us like response bid and send gym QuickBooks, Google Calendar Sync, like just, just a huge list of that. Um, our reporting and dashboards are off the hooks. We give you like 40 key performance indicators to stare at and up or down over time period, either last month compared to last month or time period last year or what have you. Um, repeat rate, again, is just a really big thing that we track and we help you build. Uh, referral reward programs can be you know created. You can do, I mean, it's freaking ginormous. We could talk about it all day long, but... Um, yeah, that's that's. You can go to servicemonster.net and kind of check out the features and functions we have there. But it's it's a massive system. It's by far the has the most overall functionality than any other service software on the pro, on the market. So Service Monster Six is a CRM, a customer customer relationship management software that allows you to manage your entire business on an online cloud based software that allows you to run your business, track what's going on, track the sales and leads that are coming in, and manage everything. Billing, collecting payments, mobile products, the whole nine. Yeah, it's a whole platform. It allows you to systematize your business. Like QuickBooks gives you some basic accounting, and it, and it integrates with QuickBooks, but it doesn't help you actually grow and scale your business. Uh, in order to do that, you have to put systems in place. Right? All the gurus talk about systems. You need systems. You need systems. That's great, and they're teaching you about systems, but service monsters like the fishing rod and the lures and, like, we'll throw some fish in the water for you. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty. And now with Send Jim's Radius Bomb hooked up to service monsters. It is. It is. You just click a button, boom, on your job, and then pff, your neighborhood gets direct mail marketing on a multi-touch sequence. So you, it's badass. So wait a second. Service Monster <laughs> 6 has integrated with Radius yep. Bomb. Yep. 100%. 
Radius, we're even, for those who don't know, yeah. Radius Bomb is an app by uh, Joshua Latimer and folks that have, uh, basically, you can draw a circle or a map or outline, you know, when you're working, if you're a service business, you can, integ- it integrates kind of with Google Maps, and you can outline an entire subdivision and a, mid- uh, a house, a city, whatever you want, and you click a button, and it... <laughs> It just broadcasts postcards to everybody via, you know, the mail service with your specialized coupons or whatever. It's a very, uh, you know, versus passing out flyers. And you guys have integrated with that. So when people that are using your software, a service tech, a lawn care guy, a, a carpet cleaning guy can be out and he'll be working in a neighborhood that he really likes. And then he'll track all the customer data and everything right inside a service monster. What's going on? And you, you know, uh, put the email in. You guys do email blasts and everything you said, right? Oh, yeah. Yep, so yep, yep. it integrates so you can click it and then do automatic five rounds? Yeah, automatic digital five rounds. And so you can do five, 10, 20, 100, whatever you want to dial it in. But essentially what we do is we allow you to set it up on the desktop portion, and then the technician's got one button. And so when they're out in the field, they're using mobile three, they're looking at the job, there's a button, send Jim, bam, you click it and you're done. It's so badass, just one little click. So if you combine that, using that with Fill My Schedule's direct mail campaign for automated thank yous and reminders, what you end up with is a direct mail prospecting machine on the front end and a client retention direct mail machine on the back end and where everybody's running to email and you can certainly do email and service work, right and everybody's been running the email for the last couple decades the mail in the mailbox is getting smaller and smaller and smaller our our fill my schedule services have an 800 percent nationwide roi period most people are getting far above that um and so it's just it's a very cool very cool little product that just really works to help build repeat rate. And then I'm really excited by Send Jim's Radius Bomb because it closes the gap on that prospecting engine on the front side. So on the front end, you got so you can decrease your marketing and advertising expenses going into stuff that isn't giving you a return on your investment and then dump it into something like Service Monster and uh, combine with a, a, a Radius Bomb and the email marketing to get the upfront. Uh, marketing going to keep the phone ringing keep the leads coming in and then you said on the back end it's doing all the tail end work for you so you've got kind of like this ecosystem that you can just that's just the direct mail funnel and right that's just the direct mail pipeline you can set up an email pipeline to do similar things you can set up call campaigns that your people inside the company can work up you can even create export campaigns that just ship to a third party uh and so that they can then process it we have drip campaigns set up in service monster 62 yes and so you can go in and say a prospect comes in on day one they get this email on day seven they get this email on day 30 they get this email so you can just so in service, automatic. can you hear me clear? Yep. Oh, so my mic. So you said a drip campaign. So you can actually, an email says, uh, you know, welcome to our uh, window cleaning service. Thank you for, here's the reasons to choose us because you got their email over the phone over of the other companies. And they're like, okay, okay. And then it'll send them an automated coupon 10% off first time. And then afterwards, it'll send a thank you much so much for your service. Please click this link to leave us a positive five-star review. Or direct mail. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, you can send it up. For yep. us, reminder, hey, let's clean yep. your windows again before Halloween. And, as soon as, and as soon as you do something, like create a new estimate or a new work order, put a job on the schedule, like it'll go, it'll stop that process and it'll restart. Right? So it's all completely automated. Oh, my God. So guys that aren't using this type of stuff are just going to be spinning their wheels, working more and more and more hours while the other companies that are using technology... So I do benchmark surveys every once in a while, right? And unlike Clean Facts or some of those other trade journals that get their uh, survey data off sending you a form to fill out and you drink a couple beers and pad your numbers and then send it in, we get our numbers from data directly. Like, you know, again, we processed $380 million in invoices for service companies last year, mostly carpet cleaning. And it's like from that data, we can do all kinds of fun things, right? Average repeat rates up or down year over year in individual states, what the average invoices are. So we publish those. And every single time, inevitably, somebody goes, yeah, but Joe, those are service monster users. I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? It's like, yeah, but they're going to be better. And they're going to have higher averages. And I'm kind of like, kind of the point. <laughs> right? I mean, they're like, yeah, those numbers don't count because 
businesses that use your product have better numbers. Ah, I wonder why that is. <laughs> um, I w can I do a screen share on this? I don't know. Try it. I, I don't know. Mm, mm, mm. Let's see. When I talk, I am loud and clear. Oh, yeah, okay, very okay. clear. Um, let's see. Rename, instant message. I don't think I can just, like, screen share here. I mean, I'm fascinated by automation because I've watched, I mean, back in the mid, I'm sorry, around 2012, 2011, I was looking up podcasts on iTunes before this whole revolution of, of how to automate my business. There was yeah. something called the Automation Podcast, and they would talk about all these things, and I hung on every word because, and then once I've experienced it in my own life, how I have email autoresponder sequences and drip campaigns going to all my landscaping employee trap subscribers, my window cleaning blueprint subscribers, my I have, uh, I'm using MailChimp for my business, and I'm sending out, um, I, I just do quarterly newsletters, but I can watch how this happens, how I've put little systems into my business that have really relieved a lot of the pressure off of me. Can you see it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is the inside of Service Monster 6. Yep. Your automation uh, software oh, yeah. for small business owners. Yeah, and if we're just talking about um, marketing. So if I just dive into marketing drip campaigns. Um, so here's a little one set up. So this top funnel is all active clients and then with these events here you can schedule them to happen at a specific time this is all you can actually friends. send them each individual customer you can you can automate a sequence to send them a 12 month or 6 month reminder for service uh -huh. again and you oh, don't, yeah. so you can actually segment each customer yep. and put them on their own yep. timing yep so they well, you base it off their last invoice date right that's super easy. Or you can base it off their acquisition date if you're dripping to a prospect campaign. Or you can, I mean, look at these filters, dude. Like all this stuff that you can key on. You can do names and account types. You could send out a drip system because you don't just keep customers in Service Monster. Because if I go into, let's say, my accounts list, kill this. And so not only can I track clients, but I can track different account types too. So I can set this up in such a way where my account type, and we'll, let's do this screen, screen. Um, I think Skype is playing havoc with my resolution a little bit. So I'll just shrink I can see down. it very clear though. Yeah, very cool. Okay, so on like you got this news feed over here, your entire customer's life history, all orders and payments, all marketing materials. Like you can as soon as the phone rings, you jump in here, you know the exact history of your client. You have to go clicking around to find stuff. And if the last thing in here is payment and it's been a year, you're doing it wrong, right? There's no reminder client marketing or anything. So cool stuff. But my point here is that you can um, – where they put it? In uh, account type. I can char do anything I want. So leads or prospects, employees, vendors, whatever. And then in my marketing campaigns, I can segment that out. Um, here's a general marketing campaign and I can target filter. Here's an invoice count. Everybody who has an invoice more than one, right? So contacts. You have a custom profile field too. I can attack kids and then send an email, mail merging to the pet's name or, you know, to the kid's name. Right, so you can get really, really creative here, like doing those targeting, and then just dialing it all together in a drip campaign sequence. Ah, uh, so the customer really calls up. up. They're like, "Hey, I got your email. I'd like to schedule service." Um, that was perfect timing. You go, "Oh, hi, Mrs. Jones. How's how's your dog Fido doing?" <laughs> like, yep. Or even better, you email and say, "Dear Fido." Not everything you do does your owner think is cute. Call us today quick before they find out. That will triple your response rate for pet owners. Oh, yeah, because if somebody sent, hey, um, last time we cleaned your carpets, I noticed Miko, our dog Miko, you know, he, yep. he left a big shit stain on the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and then you can plug in all kinds of stuff and then, you know, set up sequences to run at specific times and, you know, on specific filters, and then this is an email event. So at a specific time, it will send this email template, which will mail merge in, making it seem like you know you directly sent them a mail, and you know so on and so forth. So yeah, that's some of the basic marketing portions. The other thing I like to kind of I like how it's in. kind of mind mapped out everything. The way it's laid out is very easy to understand. We I took a I envision this. Um, 
about four and a half years ago, but the tech wouldn't support it. Online technology would not support this. And so when I went to the engineer, you know I'm an engineer, right? This entire thing is my architectural design over the last, well, 15 years really, but on this platform over the last five years. I have, you know, six um, desktop engineers and two mobile engineers working for me now as well. So they do majority of the code, but it's all my vision, my direction, and any of the stuff that ninja level lands on my desk <laughs> so um so i had this vision and so i worked with my, one of my ui engineers and we spent way more time than we should have to develop this kind of just simple you know drag and drop interfaces and making things really simple mind map out you can use this with a touch monitor i don't know if i move you won't see this one's not touch but it's you can use this too it is. Look at this. So it's all touch friendly. The whole app is designed to work on a tablet, um, you know, from a touch point of view or a touch desktop. But you see, oh my god, elements. I'm just thinking as a business owner, you must have been, you must go through hell when it comes to technical stuff and and working out kinks. Uh, oh man, we have a whole QA department. And we have uh, automated test suites that we have built that test everything. Every time we do a push, we push a button and it tests the whole platform in like 10 minutes and gives us a health report on every post. Because we push weekly. We'll push a new version every week. Like we're just so fast at everything we do. It's ridiculous. Dude. Simple things too, like obviously here's a scheduling screen. You can go into a map view um, and it will map things out for you um, in real time. And give you like route. Oh, somebody did one in Australia. So this is demo data, right? But you can kind of see a couple jobs on each schedule. There's an actual route because it's got two jobs. Job details information. If I hover over here, I get all that. I have unscheduled bucket too, um, which is kind of cool. We also have a waiting list. So if I have a client on the waiting list, and they say. Um, you know, it's two weeks out, but I'd really like it done sooner. And you say, you know, if I have an opening, I'll call you. You can actually fulfill that obligation. So now when I have an opening, I can just look. Oh, look at There's a red guy right there. Let's see. There's a job. So I've got this job here that's in that peach salmon color. It's like, oh, that's kind of might be in the same neighborhood, Mrs. Jones. And then throw that job right in there. Now I can cover that, get her on the schedule sooner, open up some availability, so on and so forth, right? So, I mean, again, I don't want to Because it all integrates right inside of a calendar, and you can see it all. It's all. It's almost like a like an AI. It is. So I built I built this tech we call proximity detection, and we do is we take the latitude and longitude of your base of operations and the latitude and longitude of any job destination. Do a little trigonometry, take into account the curvature of the Earth, and we plot bearing a destination. Then I overlay a color wheel on that and pluck a color. And so now all your like colors are in the same neighborhoods, um, and and that gives it makes it really easy. And when you use things like uh, the quick add here. So if I add, you know, I've got Google Calendar or Google addressing tied right in. So when I click on the address that I find, now I have rooftop latitude and longitude, right? And so I can do things like imaging and all kinds of stuff. Uh, just type in a couple names here. He does possible matches on the fly, like through the little quick add here. So it prevents duplication. <laughs> Dude, Real quick. Dude, it's I, I think of funny stuff. You know how Pac Man goes around and eats the things? I imagine like a, a service, the monster, your little dude, and as a commercial, he's running around on the map and he's eating jobs fast, and there's dollar <laughs> signs popping up on the screen like coins on Mario. I like that. You might see a video that looks like that. <laughs> so, anyways, you know, basic account stuff. You got custom profiles, so you can create whatever you want to track opportunities, referrals, right? Parent accounts. You can track referral and do referral reward programs. We track lead source, uh, dashboards, my favorite part. So, um, let's do last two years here. So here's this company's repeat rate and they're up and down based off previous period. Repeat rate for commercial green, residential blue. Come in here and look at sales numbers and statistics, sales pipeline, value opportunities, you know, all the customer account information, order information, where your money's coming from, how it's all broken down, 
um, scheduling, order types, are you doing drop-offs and pickups, cuttings? You have different job types too, right? Just a cutting or landscaping or a trash removal or whatever. And where's your money coming from? Your market segment, how that's all broken down. Your marketing, what's working, what's not working. Of course, you got marketplace stuff too. A- apps that snap right in, right? There's send Jim Radius Bomb, Response a Bid. We also have something called Web Forms. And uh, let's see. If I go to uh, web, web form demo. Yep. So here's an example of, a, like, let's say a service provider website. And they can snap in what we call web forms. So these little forms, just like click funnels. Mm-hmm. So you snap those in. Um, and then you, once you do, then every time someone fills something out, a lead pops in here. It'll automatically know you, notify you via email or text, depending on what you have set up. And then I can come in and accept or decline these leads, so I can decide whether or not I want I want to keep them or toss them, right? Because a lot of junk will come through that pipeline. And once you accept them, we'll just let let's accept this guy. Let's do. Let's uh, let's see. Oh, so if you've if you've got a a secretary, a tech, somebody sitting in an office on this thing, they could be managed. They can get really fluid with this whole system and and, and, and crank out a lot of productivity and generate a lot of value for the company. And now you've got a couple crews out with guys that their focus is just going out and banging out all the work. Yeah, and we have specialized apps for banging out that work too. Um, so it'll allow them to do it real easy. I can come here and I can accept, which will turn it into an account and I can move forward or I can accept the lead with an opportunity. And this is a sales opportunity. So like if I go to my Kanban board here, looks like I don't have any on the, uh, uh, let's see. Nope. These are leads. I want opportunities. I just sent it as my uh, home screen. So here's my Kanban board of opportunities. So if I have multi-touch sales processes, right, commercial accounts I want to hit three or four times before I close deals, um, I can manage all of my opportunities here, record follow-up, right, record calls that we uh, talk about, or if I wanted to schedule, you know, a new actual activity and do a, a, you know, Let's call them on the 25th and so forth, right? So setting all that up, um, real easy. And then you can manage that opportunity. You can create a new estimate. And then working with that estimate will allow you then close one or more of those deals or bids. So it's like a whole pipeline process to allow you to do sales. And then, of course, accounting, scheduling, invoicing. We haven't even looked at an order yet. So if I jump into an order... We track different kinds of orders, estimates, work orders, and invoices because they all represent different stages in the pipeline, right? So here's we're working on a work order and a real easy to fill stuff out. Um, we also have this thing called service items. So with each property, you can track stuff. So if I want to, oops, if I want to uh, add, you know, a room and I want to track its dimensions. Or windows, right? How many windows are in the house or on what areas you can do that. So Mm -hmm. it's a very small room. It's only eight square feet. (laughs) But I can then come in here and say, you know what I want to do? I want to add carpet cleaning services to that guy. Um, So 30 cents a square foot carpet cleaning service. I'm going to attach this room dimension to it. So this service item, the item I'm going to service, windows, part of the yard, like whatever it is. And now it's attached to that line item. You can see the quantity updated, eight, automatically for me. And now I have this history. I can go back and look, what did we do for this room over the course of the last three years? What did we do for this side of the house regarding windows or this area of the home? You know, what what was the landscaping project? What were they having us do to this specific service item, HVAC unit, like whatever it is, right? So service items are really powerful, um, can improve your upsell potential by a lot. 
And just little things we do to make things easy. If I click on order details, I've got all of that here in the sidecar. Real quick, I want to say something. I've been um, yeah. studying, uh, learning how to learn and meta learning and meta meta learning. And, and there's a, a this philosophy. It's called differentiation and integration. Is one of the main primary components of becoming good at something. And I see what you're doing. You're creating differenti differentiation by isolating these things and by objectifying them and identifying them and saying this is this, then you can integrate it back into the system. And by doing that and, and bringing it down to this granular level, you're taking a lot of the question marks out of how stuff like this works. So you're taking a lot of the um, confusion or added stress because if you can get it down to this level and then you can scale it back up now you've got this really streamlined system where it's almost like brembo brakes on a porsche or something like they work <laughs> really really good because it's very fine-tuned and now you can go a lot faster and you can stop you know what i'm saying if I, look at if you get five percent more margins out of using a system like this if you get 20% more productivity out of your employees because using a system like this, if you can improve your repeat rate by double, going from typically 20 or 30% repeat rate to, you know, 50, 60, 65% repeat rate, the differences in your business are astronomical. You cannot scale without systems, period, period. Putting in the most advanced systems means you can scale the best, the quickest, the fastest. It doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg to do it either, right? I mean, you know, our rates are 80 and 125 bucks a month. Those are our two rates. You know, one, two, and three routes gets you 80 bucks a month. Uh, if you have four or more routes, it's 125 bucks a month. Period. End of story. It's like not that complicated. And then, of course, you can go to our marketplace. And uh, add in all kinds of new stuff that's integrated and connected. Any lead source, because our web APIs allow you to do things like do, web forms. Real quick, you can do, do you, that on your own. Do you have service providers that are your clients, like you know, window cleaning and carpet cleaning guys? They, t you hear reports, they're like, dude, how did I even run my business without this? Yeah, our number one complaint is, I wish I would have started Service Monster sooner. Because now they finally have a dashboard with integrated st vital stats of what's going on in their business. For 10 years, I've been trying to crack. You know, I'm considered a pretty good marketing guy. <laughs> um, for 10 years, I've been trying to crack one nut. How do I get the you, that's the you post-service monster, to talk to the you, that's the you pre-service monster, and knock some sense into that dude? Like, how do I set up a campaign that will allow that to happen. Timing, well, timing. Okay, so when a guy yeah, is swimming right. for his life the and he doesn't have a life preserver and you could throw anything at him and when he's terrified or running stressed out, he feels like you're throwing him a brick or a cinder yep. block and f fuck that, fuck that. Like they, they you know, and, and, and so timing is everything by re repeatedly just keep, keep chipping away at the block and then one day you'll get that little opening where, okay, they're, they're receptive. That's right. Well, that's about brand building, right? That's the deal. So, because you're a problem solver, if you uh, if you wash windows, then what are you doing? You're solving their problem of dirty windows. No amount of marketing is going to make them pick up the phone when they perceive their windows to be clean. <laughs> so, if you market to them, it's useless marketing, but it's not. It's brand building. It's installing that brand name synonymous with the product and service you offer so that when they need it, they know how, who to call. And that's why we do all of all that value campaigns. We do more money in value campaign uh, distribution than I do in actual advertising. Right. I mean, I'm burning right now between five and six grand a month on Facebook ads and three, three and a half grand is only value. I'm only delivering the service monster show. I'm only delivering ask service monster. Uh, and then, of course, my my employees doing creative on all that. So, yep, yep. So, yeah, that's the, you know, service monsters is a way to manage that that business um, and scale and grow. You might not need it if your pen and paper Single owner operator, don't intend to grow, don't have employees, don't care about repeat rate, you're completely transactional. Under that model, Service Monster is really not going to be a big benefit to you. Service Monster is, you know, oh, am I too small to use it? 50% of our database are single owner operators and mom and pops. 
Less than 6% of our database are over million dollar earners, although that number is growing every year. We're putting more and more people over that line. So that's really cool. Um, and there's just a conception that like there's these lots of people that are these huge businesses and it's just not true. Like most um, average cleaners are making 450 grand a year. Um, you know, it's kind of in their sweet spot. And I would say most service companies are kind of in that same overall vein. They're sub million, right? And even if they're running a good operation, they're going to be, you know, plus 400,000. And then there's that guys beneath that that are really struggling to kind of break that barrier and really grow. Mm -hmm. That's where systems come in if you want to grow. If you're transactional, you don't need it. Otherwise, you freaking need it. I believe um, it, especially today. I mean, it's 2017. So how do we yeah. go back to seeing you? Is there anything else you want to show me on here? Or is oh, it? no. No, no, no. I, you know, That's powerful. Plowing through that stuff here. Let's see. How do I take it away? Change screen share settings. Share a window. Share your screen. Like I don't want. I don't want to do any of that anymore. So you integrate with Responsibid too, Kurt Kempton. Um. Yeah, Responsibid. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um. I don't establish those relationships directly all the time. Sometimes I do, but no. You tell me if I magically click on something that does how do I that's where there's nothing to stop sharing take a picture send files oh stop sharing there we go there we go Ta -da! Dude, that's... my favorite chart my favorite chart is our um, is our purchasing history based off the amount of time of acquisition data as a lead because it looks like this. It starts on one side, and it's really high, and then it dies, right? So within the first 30 days, we get the vast majority of the people purchase looking at us. And then it drops, and then it goes on this, and then it has a beep, and it goes, and it goes, and it goes, beep. And those bips are at 12 months, and 24 months, and 36 months. Exactly one year to the month since the first time they looked at us. What that tells me is they have the same problem year after year after year and if, until they buy. And, and, and they, that problem situation that, that puts them in causes them to go, damn it, I need to go look at software again. And then they go and they come take a look and then they buy. So it's just it's really interesting. It goes to what you were saying, right? Um, what's interesting to me, though, is those time periods are kind of predictable depending on what the problem is is right so you can play with those numbers as long as you understand them you have them available to you i live i live on my dashboards dude i have analytics dashboards i've got adwords dashboards i've got um, clipfolio for all of my personal crm and income dashboards i've got um, dashboards on service monster data like all via my phone and desktop i'm constantly surrounded in a swirl of data and i freaking love it man i <laughs> I don't know how I'd operate without it. It's crazy. Because it allows you, you feel to like, see. If you feel like you're suffocating, if you feel like you're treading water at all, like data. <laughs> That's all you solve it. Always. Data. Oh, I, I, dude, I wish you could like touch my forehead and transfer that so I can – because I'm still totally in service business mode. I do have a lot of the internet marketing stuff going on. That's a whole other avenue that's really helped me integrate a lot of pieces of the puzzle. And I know that people are, that are watching also have that. And just getting a perspective from you and being able to lis listen to you and get your whole perspective is like, wow, there's this whole other thing going on. It's like a very in-depth look at it. And it was very interesting. It's like being able to, you know, you see like a, a nice car and you can actually go inside of it and open up the hood and say, wow, this is how it, how it works. And why you know, is it nice? Yeah. What makes it like, yep. Is it a PT cruiser? Or are we really looking at a Ferrari here? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> very, very interesting. Okay. So, um, what are we going on? We're over an hour here. So you want to, Oh yeah. Is there anything else yep. you want to discuss? Um, no, it's just, I enjoy watching you. I wish you'd do it more every once in a while. I see you drop out. Right, is that that consistency thing, right? As far as like you're sharing with the uh, on your Facebook communities and sharing your videos and so forth, um, and I and I see it. I I think um, out of all the influencers, you're probably my favorite because you're the most authentic, even in your um, vulnerability, 
and in your goofiness and in your you know your willingness to share your pain sometimes yes. and, and I think other people try to do that but I think when they try to do it it comes off a little little less authentic I think it's a calculated move right when you do it it's just kind of because you just fell into that because <laughs> you just fall forward right when you're doing that kind of stuff which I love I think that's more it's more real it delivers a more impactful message when you can tone it and get that resonant frequency right again are you vibrating with the people who are you trying to gain attention from and so uh yeah I'd, I'd like to see you be a little more consistent in that because i enjoy your i enjoy your stuff so we can talk about that <laughs> uh thank you very much um yeah so as now i i am uh consciously and i've been doing this for four years now is making the transition into there has to be an income structure. I have a family to feed. You know, I have a, all that in I'm the breadwinner and I have to do all that. And, and so when I, I grew my YouTube channel so fast in the way that I did because of an absolute obsession with doing that, I mean, I was out, you know, filming on every job site and then getting home from work, not even showering and sitting there covered in dirt, editing videos, um, with, with, my wife upset, you know, me not coming to the dinner table. And it, it, I, I mean, I threw my whole life off balance and I put my, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it was uh, to, to the point where we were living in a, in a, in a crummy one bedroom apartment where the rent was low and I was able to do all that. And now we've moved into this nicer condo. We've, uh, we're looking at houses now. And now uh, I feel like I'm being strangled to death in very, very miserable in some ways because I'm not doing what I love to do. Um, well, like I said, when I've chased music back in the mid 2000s, um, I ended up sleeping in my car because I was doing something that wasn't generating income or revenue. However, I yep. do make money off the internet, internet and online, but um, I have to take a whole new avenue because to try to grow my company and an internet marketing and a family at once, it's you can't chase three rabbits at once. Uh, all three will escape. So, uh, my so I, I really came up against, and this is my first time actually talking about this specifically. Um, I guess you could say uh, publicly, which is um, the biggest thing that I'm facing is why would people want to listen to me about business when I haven't grown my own business past the you know the six figure mark into a million dollars if you don't see in my videos that i've got multiple crews going on and that my business is growing and i'm really growing as an entrepreneur uh my my knowledge and advice only hits a certain entry level type of uh, subscriber or watcher or for entertainment now i have been advised by several people that it's my 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 personality and my entertainment and just who i am is where i should go and and, and i've noticed that when i do talk specifically about business advice it only catches those people yeah, but i have this way more dynamic range of audience when i talk about um uh, just being myself and being i guess entertaining funny me or whatever people call it and so now um um, yeah, I want to be full blown internet and net marketer, YouTube, all that stuff. And, and I can't do both at once. So I had to really focus on my company over the past, uh, 18 months, the last year and a half, I've really, really had to, uh, slow down on the internet stuff and the amount of posting and things that I was doing and, and really iron out some kinks in my actual service business, because there was a lot of, of it that just was really, uh, I was just going through motions and not pay, not paying attention just to get the money. And now I, I right. have ironed out uh, a lot of those kinks. And I'm at a point now where I could actually start to scale up because I've ironed those things out uh, to, to a couple crews. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, I I hate what I do. I'm sick and tired of doing it. And, 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 I, and I, I don't even know if I want to go down this path right now because it's just... You drop it on the editing floor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it sucks, dude. It's like you know, you have. I, I'm, dude. I'm not a landscaper, or a window cleaner. I do. I do it to pay the bills, and yeah. that's any moment that I'm doing it. I'm just 
burning. I can't stand well, you, it. I'm at the, you remember, uh, I mean, I'm, you know, you watch Gary a lot. So, um, Oh, yeah, and the amount of focus it would take to grow and scale up a business. Oh, why don't you just scale it? Just have five trucks. Why don't you just... Yeah. Well, well, I wouldn't really be able to do my internet shit at all or post videos at all because I would have to put 100% of my focus into growing this. Well, you could just do that. It'll take you five years. Then you can get back into the internet shit when you're 40. <laughs> like, it, it doesn't... Like, I would be miserable growing something that I hate to make me money, it's I can't stand it. So I've ended up sick in bed over this. I've ended up in a really negative place. And um, sorry, I'm sorry, man. It's, no, it's no, I, it's 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 real. You know, I mean, that's it's not a. I was answering my wife. Sorry, I wasn't diverting attention. No, no, um, she's like, where are you? <laughs> I was supposed to be done already. Um, it, you know, what did he say? I think. At one point, he had taken Wine Library to thirty million, and he was only ninety-five percent happy. And so he left the family business to go start Vayner Media because he was only ninety-five percent happy. Um, who's the other guy I listened to? Um, Cynic, Simon. Simon Cynic, Cynic yeah. Um, here's another person who had a business. I don't necessarily think he grew it to a million dollars, but he was he had a handful of employees, five or six employees, and uh, you know. Again, he was doing well by every measure of entrepreneurship, but he was he wasn't really that happy, and so he tossed it all to go chase a dream of uh, of being. He has a heart of the teacher, right? And so he's really intellectual and heady, and he wants to do that. And so, and so the, the, that's what he did. But you're right. You've got to have. But here's the problem: like you've got to have a foundational knowledge in order to project real value. And fulfill that heart of a teacher. And so, you know, teaching is tough because until you have become a certain level. In your real world, your real experience, unless you've built yeah. a $2 million business, you can't then talk about running a $2 million. You dollar. can, and sometimes you'll be right, but you won't have that real power behind you of saying, look, I built a multi-million dollar business and yeah, my experiences may not map directly, but what I have to say is valuable because in order to even do that, you had to be on your game. So, I mean, I'm pushing a plow, working on my homestead, I'm processing lead changes. Like how, how can we get more leads? How can we close more deals? How can we keep clients a little longer? What kind of features are we missing against competitors that we need to, how am I going to architect though? Like the whole battlefield and the map, like the game is the game for me. Like that's, you know, and I have a heart of a teacher too, but for me, it's about the, the strategy and the platform and the, all the levels and keeping all possibilities in my mind at once and looking for clues as to finding a, which is the most probable outcome and then shifting my thinking to focus on those probabilities, right? Like for me, that's really where, where, the, where the thrill comes in. Dude, I just I, – I've had a lot of ahas just listening to you talk. Uh, I just realized something. Okay, so I built an entire um, – Internet presence, internet marketing thing. So uh, right now, it's probably four hundred thousand views a month. It peaks at five hundred thousand, and it's an average of four hundred thousand views a month online. And so, I mean, okay, so what it takes to build the amount of passion and technology and stuff combined it takes to build an, an, a marketing uh, an audience on several YouTube channels and to write. Now, I'm not trying to plug my stuff, but what it takes to actually write and publish books. And I did all oh, this graphic God. design myself and, 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 and I'm so passionate. I'm so happy about this and to build a product and completely productize the things that I've learned and, and know and put them into structured, integrated information products. That's an entire skill set and business and passion in and it of really itself is. that I'm so in yeah. love with that has nothing to do with the actual modality of running an actual service business. Right. Uh, when it comes to, you know, when you, you know, in and of itself. So my passion lies in all that stuff. And I think that I've really crossed that full component. So uh, let's wrap, wrap up here. Uh, dude, I've, I've gotten a lot of value. And I know that people uh, watching, I hope you've gotten a lot of ahas as well. And Absolutely. So Joe Kowalski, founder of Service Monster 6 over in Washington. Give me a high five. <laughs> <laughs> it was great talking to you, man, and I and I hope to talk to you again soon. And uh, I'll see you on the flip flop. How can people find you, real quick? Um, easiest way is uh, Facebook. Um, you can hit me there. Just looking up Joe Kowalski. Um, 
I'm in a, you know, pink mask. I got a big green shirt and I'm all freaking ripped. So, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, I've got, you know, 5,000 friends, but you know, feel free to follow me. I do a lot of valuable content and stuff that you can actually steal and repurpose hey, dude, you for got your some own good business. Stuff. Look him up on YouTube. He will literally teach you stuff that will you go like, Oh my God, I can use that in my business right now. So yeah, yeah. if you go to YouTube, you're going to look up service monster and look for our channel. We do two shows a week there. We do ask service monster, which is a service based Q and a, uh, for service companies. Um, so lots of value there, zero pitch, all value. And then the Surface Monster Show, um, I decided about eight months ago that I wanted to document our journey from 2.4, where we are right now, 2.4 million, 38 employees, to $30 million over the next five years. I believe it. And so we're doing it every week. Every week we're documenting the Service Monster Show, which is kind of just me talking about where we're at. We talk about our product updates, new releases, stuff that's coming out, and then a little peek behind the curtain. So that's usually about a 10-minute show. Um, so those two shows. And then uh, we just do regular content. Like I'll speak. Justin will follow me around and cut. Dude, the best 15 bucks you can spend once you already have your technicians and kind of office staff, 15 bucks an hour, find a videographer who just loves to process video, make them do all the editing for you part-time done genius it just makes it really easy yeah okay. and then again for anybody in joe's audience that doesn't know me i'm keith kelfis founder of the landscaping employee trap youtube channel and you can just look up the word landscaping or window cleaning it's uh the first search result on youtube and i'm uh, i'm a youtube guy i'm a youtuber and um just speakers just look yeah, yeah i've spoke at a couple different conventions around the country and, and that's very passion if you, if, you, if you watch my videos first time you'll be like this guy is flipping weird and then i grow on you right yeah. so okay well thank you very much and um thanks Keith. thanks joe appreciate it man later peace